found about these diaries? How, you, I know you've written for years about the Dutch uh, wartime experience. How did you find out that this trove of diaries existed? So uh, the NIOD in Amsterdam, which is the Netherlands Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies, is a library and a research center that I, I work at sometimes to do other kinds of research. And I was there last year interviewing Renee Koch, who is one of the researchers who was doing an exhibition on photographs uh, that were taken during the war, a beautiful exhibition that was um, that focused on bystander photos, photos taken by people during the war of, of what was happening. And uh, after the interview, he said, if you have a minute, let me show you something. And uh, you could uh, show the slide. He guided me downstairs through the, um, through the neod into um, This is the, the neod that we're looking at the, now, the outside. It's, it's, it's quite a beautiful building. Um, and, this, and downstairs, it used to be a bank vault. And now it still has a bank vault door, which is the entry into the archives. And that's Renee. And he showed me this entire wall of um, folders that contain diaries. Um, there are 2,100 of them stored at the Neod. And they um, are from, written from every perspective. From so these are diaries people. of Dutch people who lived through the war in, in the Netherlands. These are diaries of Dutch people um, during, um, in the last year of the war, the Minister Bolkestein, who was um, in London, gave a radio address on Radio Oranya, and he instructed people to preserve their diaries and daily correspondence letters um, so that we could have a documentation of what he called the struggle for freedom and how people lived during this period. And so this institute was actually opened four days after the end of the war, four days after liberation, and the diaries and letters came pouring in. So and these are people see, bringing the letters to the Institute as late as so the is, 1980s. This is a picture from later, but it, it, you could give you, gives you a sense. This is one diarist who wrote eight volumes of this diary and kept it throughout the war. And it's just, um, you know, every day he would write something and also put um, clippings into it and photographs. And you'll see a little bit more of this diarist later. Um, but there were there were thousands of people who submitted their their doc, their diaries to the Neod, and they've been there ever since. Okay, and so, then what's happened lately is that they've been digitized, and people are translating them. Or, or... yes, so what happened was right after the war, um, there was a team of archivists and uh, and historians who read them, summarized them, and. Um, in fact, there was a book of fragments that was made called Dachbuch Fragmenten, and, it, and some of them were excerpted for that. Um, but uh, then they were transferred onto microfiche. Um, so a lot of them are just now only exist in tiny little form. But, uh -huh. um, there, but Renee was telling me that they had started an adopt a diary program. So they were asking Dutch people to come and pick up a diary and spend time and transcribe it so that it could be legible, so they could put it into a digital form so that it could be more accessible to everybody. Okay. So they're an incredible so, resource, but they haven't been really shared. So this is, so they start really on the, first, on the day of the German invasion in 1940, which is amazing. Yeah, so what is really amazing is a lot of people just started keeping diaries on that one day. And you can see, I circled it, that was not there before, but that says May 10th, 1940. And uh, Renee told me that many of them start that day. And as you can see, some of them are handwritten like this, and then you can go forward. Um, and some of them contain photographs like this. This is a personal photograph taken of the German paratroopers um, falling you know, through the sky on, on May 10th, early in the morning. That's amazing. It's the beginning of the war. Um, we have, an, we have a, one excerpt from a diary from May 14th, which I guess was a few days after the start of the war. Um, oh, Rotterdam sorry, was as good... Uh, sorry, I, did I get that wrong? No, no, May 10th was the invasion and then the capitulation was on the 14th. So this war officially started on the Okay, so the diary says, Rotterdam was as good as destroyed by the bombardments. If they didn't cease fighting, The Hague, Amsterdam, and Utrecht would meet the same fate. I am so overwhelmed, I wept. This is someone writing in their diary. 
we weren't free anymore. And this, if we understood correctly, as a result of betrayal by our own people. We couldn't believe it, yet it was true. Everyone was glad no more people would be killed, but still, to become part of Germany, how awful. What will the future bring? Poverty for our country, a heavy ordeal for everyone, and an uncertain future. We have a question which is very relevant. I wanted to ask Nina at this stage. It's from Rene Smits in the Netherlands. We're lucky we have quite a few people from Holland logged on. And Rene says, wasn't it dangerous to keep a diary? What if the Germans found out you were keeping a diary? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that uh, I, I asked the uh, Renee about this once also that he, I don't think anybody ever got arrested for carrying for having a diary. Um, it was the same with photographs. Um, I don't think they were outlawed officially, but people took them and people kept them. And um, um, I don't know. I mean, I think they probably were dangerous if they ended up in the hands of uh, your captors, but people tended to hide them away and also make sure that they, that they were preserved. It, we should also say that for most Dutch people, the German police or SS were not very present in their lives. In most towns, there were no policemen or German policemen or SS officers. So you were not constantly under the eye of the authorities. You could do things like this or read the legal newspapers with impunity to a large degree. Yeah, I mean, that's really something we're trying to get at here today is what was life like for um, most people in Holland during the war? And how is it? So, so um, I'm sorry, I called it Holland again, the Netherlands. It's okay. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so, so the, the Nether what's really remarkable, um, Nina, as you've written very eloquently about the Netherlands is that uh, there were about 130,000 Jews during the war. 80% of them were murdered. Um, and it's the highest percentage of Jews killed of any Western Europe country. And yet this is a country without a strong history of anti-Semitism, without, um, it didn't have pogroms, it didn't have, it wasn't one of these places like Poland where there was, it was an established part of the culture. So what happened? How could this have happened in, in, in a country like this? And what do these diaries reveal about that story? What is, how does it, how does it answer that question? Mm -hmm. What are we looking at here? So this is a picture of Amsterdam. Amsterdam was not bombed by the Germans, but it, uh, well, there was there was a there was one bomb dropped on Amsterdam. But this is a picture of the um, in uh, the oil reserves that were actually destroyed by the British that that created um, a, a lot of smoke and fire on the harbor as people were trying to flee Amsterdam. So this is just a picture of that on May tenth, I think. Okay. And this is a remarkable picture further into the war. Could you tell us what we're seeing here? This is an image of De Wach, which is in the New Market Square in central Amsterdam. And it's um, today it's a very busy cafe, you know, uh, area. But in, um, in the war, it was fenced off. It was the edge of the Jewish quarter. So essentially, it was made into a ghetto for the Jews. It was the edge of the ghetto for the Jews. Of the, of the Jewish quarter. But there had there had always been a Jewish quarter in Amsterdam. Simon, there had there had always been yeah. a Jewish quarter in Amsterdam. Uh, Spinoza had lived in the Jewish quarter until he was expelled from the synagogue. Rembrandt also lived in the Jewish quarter because the Jewish quarter was never entirely Jewish. It was never a complete ghetto. And when the war broke out, about half of the population of the Jewish quarter weren't Jews. But nonetheless, this was a neighborhood in the middle of town. It was quite proletarian, where largely working class Jews lived and in, in strong harmony with the rest of the population, but they were still uh, distinct. You could tell that they were Jewish. Because it also so said on their passports that they were... Yeah, on your identity card, and this proved fatal, your religion was marked. So it was very easy for the Nazis when they took over this very well-organized country to find out who was Jewish because it said on your ID card. Well, also the Jews were required to register immediately. Like uh, there were two decrees under the Germans that required the Jews to register as Jewish or, and if they were found out that they weren't, then they would be also arrested for that. But uh, the history of the Jews in the Netherlands goes back to the 16th century when there was a large influx of Portuguese Jews um, who uh, had come and were um, quite, uh, well accepted into the Netherlands. And the Jewish quarter is, is a really beautiful ancient part of the city too. I mean, not ancient, but um, 
very old part of the city, there are there's a cluster of synagogues still right in that area. But by the um, end of the 19th century, uh, there um, that was more Jews were more integrated into the Netherlands. And in 1930, there was an influx of Ashkenazi Jews from mostly from Austria and Germany, who like came into Anne the Frank's city. Family. Like Anne Frank's family, exactly. Right. And they exactly. and they very quickly integrated into the life of the city and didn't necessarily live in the Jewish quarter. They lived right. in the Revering Garden. They, they, they also tended in... to be wealthier and they, so it was also class distinction. Right. Is that right, right. Simon? Exactly. Yeah, uh, Nina mentioned earlier the minister's appeal for people to keep their diaries. Anne Frank was one of the people who heard that. She was already keeping a diary. And then she started to rewrite it in a slightly more organized literary way when she heard the minister's appeal because she wanted it to be preserved after the war and to be published. And as we would all do it, we thought our diaries were going to be published. <laughs> we would immediately start to rewrite that. So, uh, could you tell us what we're looking at here? Because we're trying to get what it was like for um, non-Jews in the Netherlands to suddenly see uh, their neighbors being deported. Yeah, this is a bystander photo of the kind that Nina referenced. This is a small town in the southwest in Zeeland, where a Jewish family, the butcher and his wife and two children, are getting on the train to go to Rotterdam to be deported. And the whole town has come out to see them. There are no German police because it's a small town. There is one local policeman. And there are also ordinary people on the train who are just going to Rotterdam for the day, as well as this Jewish family who are being deported. Wait, the so butcher, who's deporting them if there are no Germans there? Is it the Dutch? Um, a Dutch the Dutch police, just okay. as Anne Frank was arrested by the Amsterdam police. So it's not that the Germans are coming in and exercising this reign of terror, which the Dutch are not part of. The Dutch police and the Dutch railways are part of this. Um, but here you see, uh, probably the town is sympathetic to the butcher, but you see that there is no intervention. And this is also an issue that we come to with the Netherlands. There is very little anti-Semitism I and mean, there's little strong and violent anti-Semitism, but there's also very little intervention. And I think it's also part of the same thing. This is an obedient country, it's a law abiding country, and it's not a country with guns or violence. So people didn't really know what to do when confronted with the Nazis. So the whole town comes and watch this family, watches this family go to their deaths. What do you mean it's not a country with guns or violence? They're... I mean, the political culture in the Netherlands was extremely tame. I mean, if you think of the 20s and 30s, you know, in Germany, there are street fights of Nazis and communists killing each other, in Paris as well. And in, Fr in Holland, the Nazis and the communists would have arguments. So they would shout things at each other at most. And there hadn't been a political murder in the Netherlands since the 17th century at this point. People didn't have guns. People didn't even go hunting. I mean, there wasn't any space to hunt. There were no partisans. Uh, the resistance in the Netherlands was mostly, mostly passing around newspapers, illegal newspapers. It just wasn't a culture with much violence, with resources of violence. So how do you confront the Nazis? But from um, th this uh, brings us to a, a section of the um, diaries that Nina has translated, which is from you know, there was sympathy for the Germans in some quarters, and you, we, she has an extract from from one uh, Dutch woman, a sympathizer, who writes: "The way the Germans acted was so proper, so magnificent, so disciplined. They command res nothing but respect. The locals could learn a lot from the Germans. Just look at them marching by on foot." or on horseback with their guns looking so beautiful, so healthy with such cheerful faces. So they were certainly got some uh, admiring responses. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say, Nina? Yes, absolutely. One of the things that's changed in the time that I've lived here, and it started to change before I lived here, but, but it has changed over the last few decades, is this um, sort of reputation as the Dutch people of being mostly resistors, you know, um, to, um, you know, a recognition that um, a lot of people in the Netherlands welcomed the Nazis, participated. Um, and there were Jew hunters who were who made who earned 15 guilders a head for every Jew that they turned in. There were there were people who were participating, and not only that, but you know, in small ways, collaborating in ways that um, I think, on some level, in in one way or another, everybody who wasn't. Resisting, of course, was yeah. the collaborator. But um, Simon, maybe you could show us, tell us what we're seeing in this picture here, because it relates to what Nina's saying. It does. This is 1943 in Amsterdam. What you see on the boat is Jewish possessions taken from their houses as people were deported and being taken away, uh, plundering. And what you see on the quay are normal Amsterdamers, Gentiles, looking on. 
understanding what is happening to 10% of the city's population, that these people are likely not going to come back. And uh, again, you see the passivity. I mean, these people are also thinking, well, what can I do? Um, I don't have a gun, etc. So people in Amsterdam had a very strong sense after a while what exactly was going on. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that really struck me when I first moved here in 2006 is that I, I am um, the daughter of Holocaust survivors. And for me growing up in America, I had this sense of, you know, you're, maybe you the should, Jews We would... should say your mother is from, uh, born in Hungary, but then moved to... My mother was born in Slovakia, but she lived oh. during the war in Hungary. Sorry, and they I got lived... it first, yeah. No, no, it's okay. And then they also lived in Czechoslovakia. Um, after the war but they um but you know i was told stories as a child a little bit about the war not much but um i i in my mind for some reason i got the idea that the jewish population was very atomized and that it was kind of easy to target them and that maybe people didn't know what was happening to them and so when i came here i I just, I felt like the city is so small and no matter where you go, you see everything, you know? I mean, it's a, it's a very, people are on but top isn't of that true? That, that's certainly true for uh, a place like Amsterdam. It's so small. And that was probably where, uh, in big cities were, were where most Jews lived. So if you, Simon, if you were in, living in the countryside, would you know about the deportations? Would you know what was happening? Possibly, but probably not. Of course, people didn't want to know. They didn't want to find out. And Auschwitz was unimaginable to people in 1942. But there's one story of a Jew from uh, the northern part of the Netherlands fleeing south of the rivers to the Catholic region and saying to people, I'm a Jew, I need to hide. And he found he had to explain what a Jew was. And then people would say, <laughs> OK, so why do you need to hide? Um, because you know, for most people in the Netherlands, this was very, very far, if you were in the countryside, from your daily experience. In, in rural areas, Jews were often middlemen, they were merchants. So they would not be the farmers, but they would sell the, uh, sell the castle at the market, that kind of thing. But there would not be many in each small town. You know, we one of the that... German measures, of course, was that all Jews who lived in other parts of the Netherlands had to, mo had to move to Amsterdam, to the, to the uh, Amsterdam Jewish Quarter. So even, and also people who had lived in other parts of Amsterdam had to move to the Jewish Quarter. We have a, another uh, excerpt from one of, the one of the diaries that you cite, Nina, um, from a, a businessman, a salesman for an English asbestos company named Cornelius Komen. Maybe I'll just read a bit of that if that's okay. Um, yeah. He's, he's going on a trip to the countryside to pick cherries for the day and he's suddenly crowded on a train with lots of Jews who are being uh, I, I don't know if they're being deported at that moment. He's, he writes, many people on the train don't even know what's going on in Amsterdam. The last Jews are being rounded up, herded together and taken away like cattle from hearth and home to foreign parts. First they're taken to Vught, then they're transported to Poland. Oh, the misery these people must be going through, separated from their wives and children. They may not be a pleasant people, but they're still human beings. How can the good God allow this? Simon, do you think that what might have been, uh, or Nina, do you think that might have been a typical way of looking at this is a terrible thing happening to those other people kind of perspective? Nina, what do you think about that? I think about that diary all the time after, since I read it the first time. I, I, I think it's really a powerful testament, not only to that, to that situation, but maybe to the way a lot of us are today too. You know, we see things that are happening that are terrible in the world and we also, say, but you know, I'm, I'm still gonna go pick, pick cherries today, you know? But I think, I, I think it does speak, and what these diaries do in general is they speak to the mentality of the people of, of you know, what, a lot of people are weighing moral questions, like how can I see this happening and still go on with my life? But a lot of people felt like if they just tried to do things as normally as possible, it wouldn't be so bad. Or um, they also didn't know, a lot of people are weighing like, what are the, what's the purpose of my doing something because then I, I would be arrested or maybe it would just be worse for that person eventually. So the, you do see people mulling these moral ethical issues um, quite frequently in the diaries to a degree that you may, may not expect actually, I think. I, I, I would say that this comes to the key question about the Dutch war, which is to what degree do people feel they have to make big moral decisions or do they, are they just trying to get through it to worry about their own problems, their own family? 
And so the first director of the NEOD, Lou de Jong, who's a historian, he becomes the official state historian, he creates this notion of you're either in the Dutch war goed, you're good, or you're fout, you're wrong. And that everybody can be placed on, along one of those two poles. And that kind of dominated Dutch historiography for the first 30 years or so after the war. And then in the 80s, uh, Hans Blom comes along at Leiden University. He doesn't write much, but he gives this very influential lecture where he says, actually, goed and fout, right or wrong, are not how most people in the war were understanding their lives. They were much more just trying to get by, trying to get through, not to incur damage, to have enough to eat. And so to apply retrospectively this right or wrong, goed or fout scheme on them, it's not how they understood it at the time. And um, I mean, the question is, did people feel at every stage that it was this great moral moment that they had to decide whether they were gonna be hoot or fout or? No, uh, I think part of the thing is that it was also an incremental change that was happening. So in the beginning, the Germans were, you know, they had a kind of light occupation or people thought it would be, and they didn't institute anti-Jewish measures immediately. They waited six to nine months and then they started to implement them slowly. So um, people thought, well, it's not gonna be so bad here. And, you know, the Germans treated them more like cousins or neighbors than they did in other parts of Europe. Certainly they didn't come blasting through the way they did in Poland, um, you know, but so, so I think, in a way it was harder for people to reconcile what was happening and know how to take a moral stance. Because if you see something happening immediately uh, and you know you have the option to do something. Right, you know, that, that brings us back to the diaries because they really do show in a very intimate way how difficult it is and while you're living through a historical moment to sort out exactly what's going on and what your options are. So we can look maybe um, at some more pictures of diaries, this is, um, yeah, just to give you, know, you a sense of how through. diverse they are. There's, some of them are written like this. They're, um, they're handwritten and sometimes they include little pictures of what's happening on the street, personal photographs. Uh, you can go to the next one. The, sometimes people, um, this is actually, I think, an NS Bayer, someone who supported the Nazis. Um, the NS Bayer was the Dutch, the Dutch Nazi party. The, yes, Nazi party, essentially, yeah. Essentially, yeah. And um, so here's somebody who's traveling um, for, on behalf of that party and he maps out where he went to in pictures. Uh, the next one is here, some of them are like this where they're like, you know, meticulously um, organized and by month and with tabs and so forth. <laughs> and uh, this is that same diary. This is, you know, typed out page by page and inserted into this booklet. The only thing I can understand from that is, is your signs, your father. Right? Your father, yes. Yeah. Darth Some Vader in Star Wars comes from Darth the Vader. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's the only reason why I knew that Vader was father. Yeah. Um, it must be the German, I think. Some of them are, this is um, someone after, in, in retrospect, is noting down the important events of the war uh, with this nice kind of calligraphy. Um, and a, if you like, walking yeah, you know, another one. swastika at some point. <laughs> and a, a walking swastika, right? <laughs> this is uh, a chronology of the war that yeah, you this is the chronology. Yeah. What, what's striking about the diaries is how much effort some people obviously put into creating them and what, how it must have been a very meaningful way for them of getting through the war. People put incredible like effort into it. I mean, you can just imagine, I mean, just having, you know, not that much else to do in a way. And, this is an example of someone who clipped out all the articles about the Jewish measures. So you can see all the different Jewish measures on here. Um, the movie theaters are closed for Jews, um, closing of the schools, the public services are no longer available for Jews. Yeah. So, so I mean, this shows, Simon, that it was really very much out in, it was in the newspaper. So even if you were in the countryside, you would have seen that these measures were happening, right? But it I don't was. think this was in the official newspaper. Sorry, I think these are these are underground newspapers. Ah. But also, what's important to realize about the Dutch war is the Netherlands was divided into religious, into pillars, into different groups. That's how society works. There was a Catholic pillar where you were born in a Catholic hospital, you went to a Catholic school, you married a Catholic, buried in a Catholic funeral, uh, uh, Catholic cemetery, a socialist pillar, a more uh, upper class pillar and then there was a very small Jewish pillar and these pillars were sort of separate and people dealt with each other quite well and quite amicably 
but what was happening in another person's pillar was not necessarily your problem. You weren't, you wouldn't, for instance, marry outside your pillar. Well, for Catholics, uh, marrying a Protestant was very, very difficult. And you ran the risk of being buried in a separate cemetery at the end of your lives together. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, these pillars were very strong. And the Jews were the smallest pillar of all, you know, because there were so few of them. But nonetheless, that was how the Dutch kind of made sense of them. And these pillars were not, it wasn't hostility. It wasn't um, that the person in the other pillar was bad, but they were not a big part of your life. Um, I just want to be cognizant of the fact that we have many questions now in chat. Simon, I hope you're keeping track of them because I'm, I'm not and we'll... Um, I, 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 am, I am looking okay. a bit. Yeah. We'll, try, we'll, we'll get to some of those soon. So here's uh, the, the... Yeah, so this is the people I mentioned put in their snapshots. This is, um, this is a picture of um, food relief being dropped in Rotterdam, I believe, like uh, packages of food or supplies. And this, I love this one because this is um, a diary that has these beautiful hand-drawn and watercolored illustrations. And um, some of them are really moving. I mean, this, this one is- This is a Dutchman a, being stopped by a, a German soldier. Who for some reason is asking him for his parachute and copper money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is, uh, yeah someone being woken in the middle of the night by Germans at the door in his pajamas. Mm. And it just says uh, they wore steel helmets and were wearing and were dressed in gray uniforms. Uh, this is a, a series of three diaries written by Miriam Bola. She was um, a member of the Jewish Council. She worked for the Jewish Council in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, she is now 103 and living in Israel. She, she was deported to the camps, but she survived because she was traded in an exchange for German prisoners of war uh, with Palestine. So she managed to survive, um, but she has this beautiful diary that was also, that was previously translated um, and is published by Yad Vashem. So she was a member of the Jewish council. Do I have that right? Yeah, so the Jewish Council was an organization that was set up by the Nazis basically to make the Jewish people organize themselves and but it was also um, it, it became a terrible organization because the Jewish Council was required to choose um, essentially who could be protected and who had to be deported and little by little of course the circle got um, tighter and tighter until eventually all the Jews in the Netherlands were deported but um, to be but a member if you of were a Jewish member council, of the Jewish council were you more likely to survive the war you were actually yeah probably because you lived longer but so they were the leaders of the Jewish community but then they were put in a position of basically having to decimate their own community and um, just like and this the is Jewish how it Bank, went around, and this is how it went around Europe I mean the Nazis preferred to work with Jewish councils in every country Right. Yeah, that's true. We have a, a, an excerpt from Miriam uh, Bowles diary. Um, it's, it's actually not from her diary. It's from a letter that she wrote to her fiance, but that she never sent. Um, and apparently, so people who were uh, in sick or infirm were being rounded up. So uh, they were often put hidden kind of in relatives homes, so they wouldn't be taken away. She writes, Miriam writes, my hands are trembling so much. I can barely write. This is all getting too much. This is more than anyone can bear. Another transport is leaving this evening. I plan not to go to bed too late. Aunt Dina is staying with us at the moment. I already wrote to you, she stays at our house during the day because she has been left at home on grounds of illness. Um, she writes that when they had to pick her up in an ambulance and the neighbors came around and she said, she told the neighbors, my aunt has become unwell, so we had to pick her up. And would you please excuse me now if her mother isn't at home. This is the kind of act you have to put on because it would be unwise to reveal too much well-intentioned gossip could fall on the wrong ears. So it shows the level of suspicion that there was. Can I ask Nina a couple of the questions we were getting from the audience? Sure. Sure. Uh, Candida Bowman asks, what kind of criteria did the Jewish Council use to decide deportations? So the Jewish Council didn't decide deportations. They, they, they helped decide uh, exemptions, as I understand it. So if you got a letter from the Jewish Council exempting you from a deportation, then you were protected. Um, 
that's how I understand how it works. I'm not an expert on this subject, but um, the criteria was basically used, uh, was established by the Germans more than the council. But the council uh, was asked to, um, to, to prepare lists. God, it's not coming back to me, that's right. They, they were, they were, I don't know. You know the answer they, better than I do. And okay. they could say that somebody needed to be protected because he or she was a secretary at the Jewish Council, et cetera. So they were so in a position could, to hand out favors. They could hand out favors like yeah. that. Um, yeah. Amy Wesson asks, was there a point of time or singular event that changed public opinion of those who had been initially pro-Nazi or alternatively, did people just stay pro-Nazi? Did you get a sense of this, Nina, from uh, reading the diaries? You mean, that, uh, people that sort of about... changed their minds. During the war? Yeah. In, oh, I know that's a good question. I don't think that there was a sea change of, of public opinion at any point during the war. I think there were a lot of, uh, I think people sort of, and, and maybe Simon, you know this better than I do, but I think there, there were some resistance moments, obviously, in Dutch history. There was the February strike. And there was also at the end of the war, the strike of the R Dutch railway. But um, the February strike was fairly early. There was a group of, of, um, of men who uh, protested and, but they were all uh, shot. You know, what are we <laughs> so seeing in this kind of picture here? Yeah. Is this another picture from the diaries? This is another picture from a diary. This is a photograph of some people having a nice meal and um, they have the whole menu of what they ate that night. Amazing. In French to sound more glamorous and upmarket. In French. To <laughs> themselves up. And, then and this is a, yeah, th that was, and you can see the musical notations. This is for a, a German song. Um, and I wanted to mention also that there are like 500 of the diaries are from Indonesia. They were written by Dutch nationals who were in, held in internment camps by the Japanese. And um, you can see from these diaries, this one is just extraordinary. That has a lot of illustrations of what camp life was like. And I think in these, there was a question about this as well that came up. These were... Um, um, I don't even know how they made a diary. I don't know how they made it. I don't know how they saved it. And I don't know how they got the paper for it. But I mean, it's just extraordinary that, that, that it survives. Because you so what we're see seeing here, si Simon, I remember you're reading some of this to us, is just a description of the terrible treatment that these prisoners received at the hands of the Japanese. Yeah, you can, there's a line you can, uh, towards the bottom, Ein von hen sloeg niet hard genoeg. One of them didn't beat hard enough and therefore was beating himself, jiu-jitsu grips, kicks against shins, uh, beatings with fists, etc. So it's a description of the violence that they underwent. And these poor people, when they came home from the Indies and told the Dutch how much they'd suffered in the war, the response they usually got was, well, it was much worse here, and um, you know, we don't want to hear about your problems. So there was also competitive post-war suffering, and the people in Indonesia were, were not given much sympathy. And here you can see there's also trains and the you, it's very well illustrated how, what kind of life they had there and then if you can skip to the next what was also interesting was that they didn't a lot of people you know were so um determined to write down their experiences that they used whatever materials were on hand and in this case it's the back of monopoly money amazing um and in this case it's the it's a cigarette rolling paper this is in and the I, indies still isn't it this still is in the indies also yeah so actually, yeah. But so this is an example of what some of the diaries look like, which is why they need this transcription project is because they're, they really, some of them were photocopied in this very illegible way. You can't even, it's, you know, people, a lot of scholars, um, Rene told me he's sent a lot of scholars down into the, into the diaries in the past and they go with great enthusiasm, but then they give up after, you know, <laughs> A couple of days because it's so hard. Don't to give up, Nina. Through. Keep at it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so hard to read them. Um, but these are this. This is helpful material. Which were, these were little forms that the diarists had to fill out when they submitted their diaries to give a sense of who they were, where they came from, how they kept their diaries, and, um, and what their hobbies and, were. While they and were... also what their hobbies were, what their favorite <laughs> books were, and. Uh, it's, it's amazing how it's, you can really uh, create a portrait of their of their their lives from these documents. Yeah. 
And this is um, the scholars. Oh, sorry. The last one was a picture of um, the historians who who filed away the diaries, did little critiques of them to talk about what they contain and how well written they are and whether they're told from a very immediate perspective or in retrospect. So they're quite interesting that way. Yeah. Simon, are there other questions we want to address before we go on to um, the next diary? Um, let me see. Mike Feigelson asked, Nina, do you think the more recent recognition among the Dutch that they didn't do enough has led to any big changes in the way Dutch society thinks about moral dynamics and their willingness to intervene? Uh, for example, thinking of Srebrenica, where the Dutch UN troops again failed in exactly the same way as the Dutch did during World War II to protect the local Bosnian population from massacre. Do you feel that this has prompted a soul searching, the kind of the Dutch admission that the war wasn't as good as originally presented? I think there's been a soul searching. I mean, I can talk about what's happened here. Um, there has there has been more work done on memorializing those who were killed. Um, there's going to be a National Holocaust Museum that's finally being built in the Netherlands. It's going to open in 20, 2022, 2023. I think, um, I mean, soul search, I, I, I can't take the temperature on soul searching within the Dutch nation. I don't think I'm qualified to do that. But I think there that it is part of a change of the historiography, certainly. There's a lot more um, research and work being done on, uh, you know, the failures of the past. And do you uh, find where, where you're where you're in school, there are young Dutch people who want to study the war and want to get involved in historical documentation. What, uh, I don't really meet that many students. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that I grew up in the 70s and 80s with the idea that everyone had been in the resistance and the big film that everybody watched was Soldier of Orange, which was a resistance film. And from the 90s, as the wartime generation died off and younger people started to write the history, then came the recognition, actually, it wasn't like that. So it's in the 90s mm -hmm. that you get a much more realistic picture of, of what happened. But still, when I checked in the Neil some years ago now, there were six times as many books on the Dutch resistance as on Dutch collaboration. So it was still, you know, a big part of the historiography. That's right. And I think that's also important because, like, there was there's a resistance museum here. There's the Anne Frank House, which... I mean, I, it, it's it's a very complicated story. It's a very important story, but it it gives the impression that Dutch people protected the Jews. I think more than yeah. anything else, in a way, and so that was a narrative that I think overwhelmed all the other narratives. You know, so that was a very important diary because it gave us a perspective that um, people can relate to, and that's why I think we need to have more of these voices. You know, to tell other stories about who people were in the war and. Like Simon said, it's not, you know, there's not black and white. There's a lot of gray areas and there's a lot of people with moral conflicts internally and a lot of people, you know, who are not necessarily bad, but maybe didn't act or, you know, collaborated without meaning to, or even, you know, there were Jewish people who were um, accused of being collaborators. These art dealers that I've written about were some of them who after the war were considered collaborators because they worked with the Nazis to, um, to sell art. I mean to get art for the for the Nazis, but the they were and Jews who help and Jews who helped with the de deportations, like Weinleben, and made profits out of betraying people. So yeah, there were all sorts of stories. Yeah, yeah. On, on all sorts. Um, just on the, along the lines of uh, uh, on literary lines, you um, you found in the archives the uh, the diary of Philip Mechanicus, which which was actually published. It was in the the nineteen sixties. Yeah, sixties. But who um, was it very important for you? What was it that it, that really impressed you about Mechanicus's story? He was a middle-aged Jewish man who was himself deported, but kept a diary. Yes. So Philip Mechanicus was a Jewish. He was a journalist. Um, he was a, a foreign correspondent for what is now the NRC, which was the uh, the uh, National Handelsblatt, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I don't. I'm maybe wrong on that. But um, he became, he was fired immediately. That was one of the first measures that the Germans instituted was the firing of, of Jewish journalists. Um, then he was arrested because he was, wear, he was not wearing his Jewish star properly on the tram. And he ended up in Westerbork, which was the transit camp um, where almost all the Jews from the Netherlands went before they were deported to the concentration and death camps in the East. Do you have and an he, excerpt from his diary that you want to read us? Nina? Yeah, 
Yeah, I just want to say that this is um, what his diary really looks like in real life. You can see how uh, faded it is, but also, you know, how detailed it is. And on the next page, you can see how he wrote, like, in every single available space in the margins here along the sides. And so this was, um, this was trans uh, transcribed and published in Dutch and then published in English as well in 1968, but it's gone out of print and the only editions that are available are very expensive. But and, you, you um, love him as a writer. Like he's But I love him. As, I, mean, I think he's an incredible writer and he's somebody, you know, who is a skilled journalist who is for two years stationed in this camp and reports on it daily with so much emotion and and I would sit there reading sections of this and just, I was just blown away. So I'm going to read you some. Great. You ready? Um, this is Tuesday, January 25th, 1944. In a tearing gale and pouring rain, a transport of 1,000 persons left for Auschwitz. Once more in cattle trucks. The majority were supplied by the S-Hut, 590 people. The rest were young men of the Aliyah, old men from the hospital, and 31 small nameless children who had been in the orphanage and whose parents were either in hiding or, ha or had already been sent to Poland. Among these children was a 10-year-old boy with a temperature of 39.9 degrees, that is a tenth of a degree too low for him to be included among the luck lucky people who were unfit for transport. People still do not know what happens to the deported Jews in Poland. They curse the National Socialists and search for names to express their feelings, which are a combination of contempt and loathing, horror and hatred, but nobody can find the right word. When will the war be over? When will the misery of these weekly transports come to an end, lament the women. The war is going well, but there is a transport going every week, the men say scornfully to those who are confident that the war will soon end in allied victory. The winter is, on, is far on now, and they fear that if the decisive blow does not fall this winter, the war will go on throughout the summer and not a single Jew will be left on Dutch soil. Hope alternating with fear. Where are we going? What will our fate be? What lies in store for us? Thank, thank you for, for reading that. Um, um, Pamela, I just have a couple of moving testimonies from uh, our uh, class, which I'd like to read just a couple of very quickly. Yes. Uh, Marlies Simons uh, writes that her, she's gone back to her mother's diary prompted by Nina. Her mother was a, na a nurse drafted by the Red Cross and wounded soldiers from Belgium and the Netherlands and Ireland wrote in 1940s to thank her for her care. Would this be of interest to the Neald? I imagine so. We have another person who hasn't yet given me permission to mention his name, but whose grandfather was a political prisoner in The Hague, from The Hague, was an engineer and was killed in a camp as a political prisoner. And Renee Smits makes the point that last week there was a lot of uh, talk in the Netherlands about the speech by the Dutch king on the commemoration of War Day on May 4th. And the king expressed personal dismay about his great grandmother in London at, during the war, who didn't express strong support for the plight of the Jewish citizens during the war. So he criticized his great grandmother and he mentioned that many looked away and didn't acknowledge the people who were persecuted. And the king talks about how the Holocaust starts with a sign in the Fondel Park in Amsterdam saying no Jews. So these are a couple of, um, hmm. uh, a couple of yeah, notes from our audience. Say. Nice. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. Um, Nina, sorry, Nina, who are we seeing here? So yeah, um, so I mentioned this project to transcribe the diary. So I went to visit one of the transcribers. This is Josine Franken. She's um, a volunteer. She works with the Adopt a Diary program and she lives in Bake, uh, which is the, uh, a place where the Germans had a military camp during the war. And so she's standing in a place where there used to be two houses, one on either side of her. And in that place, uh, each woman, there were two women, one on each side, both kept diaries. And she's translated, she's transcribed both of those diaries. So it's quite interesting to have this perspective from literally across the road <laughs> on some of the same events. And she lives there. So for her, it's really interesting to learn the personal histories of the, of the townspeople and events that were really moving for for her for the local people um and this is um just a sense for people who are interested to look further into this this is what the diaries can look like on the digital form now with the niad this is what the niad is doing they, in the middle you can see the diary on the right you see the transcription 
and um, and uh, so it's like very clear. You can also search them, you know, with keywords and things like that. So it makes them much more accessible to everybody. And, and so far, they've got about ninety done, and they're and they're working on more. Great. Well, it's an amazing labor of love, this project, and um, it's it's wonderful, Nina, that you're bringing it to the rest of us through your work. Uh, Simon, are there other, we're going to have to wind down in just a minute, are there other questions or comments you want to you want um, Eric Weinberger makes the entirely correct point that most of the diaries are not by Jews and are not talking specifically about that. And it's true, there is a realm of very important topics we could have explored, but we've chosen to focus our talk today on that particular issue. Yeah. Which, after all, is the accounts for half the war deaths in the Netherlands is the murder of the Jews. Well, I think we've come a tiny bit of the way to answering the big question that we set out to answer at the beginning of this conversation, which is how exactly could this have unfolded? Um, Nina, I suspect you're going to spend many years uh, answering the rest of that question, as will many other people in the audience here. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today.